extend a, a special thank you to the History Center. Um, folks have seen this agenda and, and looked at the speakers and said, how in the world did you get this incredible group of people together for these two days? And um, that is the result of Pat Sullivan um, knowing, I think, everyone in this field who is of, uh, of note. And, and all Pat had to do was reach out to, uh, to her friends and colleagues, and they were more than happy to join us for this. So thank you, Pat, for um, I also wanted just quickly, um, you know, Richard Gergel is joining us on the panel this morning, but I want to just have a personal point of privilege to, to thank uh, his wife, Belinda Gergel, who is here as well. Uh, Belinda. Linda was the president of Historic Columbia when, when I joined the organization. She actually hired me. And um, she worked very closely at the time on the board with Steve Morrison. And I feel like the way that this organization has pointed over the last 15 years is due in large part to the vision that Belinda and Steve really set out for Historic Columbia. And, and the reason that we're doing programs like this today uh, the reason that we made the shift that we did at the Woodrow Wilson Family Home as an example to the Museum of Reconstruction really is thanks in large part to the vision of, of Belinda um, and, and Steve. So thank you for being here today. And, and the other person I just want to um, mention who's with us is Allison Summy. Allison is a member of the Board of Trustees for Historic Columbia. Um, Allison also is a wonderful um, judge and a great legal mind in her own right, but um, Allison is also the niece, niece of, of Matthew Perry, uh, who Dr. Kennedy spoke extensively of yesterday. I know many of you know as well. Uh, just a few quick logistics for the morning. You go out the door and to the right, the restrooms. Um, there is free admission to the museum today with your attendance at this symposium, so it's all yours during breaks, um, after we're finished for today. We have a new reconstruction exhibit on the fourth floor, and I encourage you to, to check that out. There's also a great uh, exhibit called Requiem by Leo Twiggs. It's an art exhibit. It's about the Mother Emanuel um, events, and it's beautiful and important, and I encourage you to, that's also on the fourth floor. There's also a 10% discount in the Cotton Mill Exchange uh, if you are uh, attending this conference. So uh, we're very thankful to the State Museum for hosting us, allowing us to use this beautiful space. Also just want to quickly thank those who made this possible through financial support. Uh, South Carolina Humanities, the South Carolina Chapter of the American Board of Trial Advocates, the University of South Carolina School of Law, USC's Center for Civil Rights, <coughs> History and Research, Burnett, Shutt, McDaniel, Harkutlian, Attorneys at Law, uh, Rogers Lewis, Nelson Mullins, Carver Construction and Design, and of course last night we had a great program at Allen and they generously um, allowed us to use the Chappelle Auditorium as well. So again, thank you all for being with us today. Um, I will turn the program over to Dr. Kennedy. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So we have a great panel uh, in store for you this morning. 14th Amendment from Reconstruction to the Civil Rights Act. And I'm going to briefly introduce uh, our panelists. First, Margaret Burnham from Up My Way. Um, well, Margaret Burnham is a professor at Northeastern University Law School. It says here that she's the, the director, and of course she is the director of the Civil Rights Restor Restorative Justice Program. I want to say one word about that. It's a fabulous program that is devoted to um, unearthing the facts around racially motivated violence, racially motivated uh, murders between approximately 1930 and 1950. And already uh, that program number of faculty members, but probably most importantly, students, have really contributed very importantly to filling in a, uh, an important part of the story of American history, a part of the story that's often uh, overlooked. And I look very much forward to hearing from Professor Burnham. Secondly, we have 
Judge Richard Gerbel. Um, many of you know him. He's he was a lawyer here for a long time. He's now a United States District Court judge, sits in Charleston, and has recently put the last licks on a book that I really look forward to reading. It's a book about um, Judge Wayne's wearing, and perhaps we'll be hearing some. Uh, something that's drawn from the research that has gone into that book. Next we'll be hearing from uh, Patricia Sullivan. And Patricia Sullivan, of course, is a professor of history at the University of South Carolina. She's written a number of works. The one that, uh, I like them all, <laughs> but uh, the one that I like the most is Lift Every Voice, and it's a history of the NAACP. And for my own work, I, I, I've read it actually a couple of times now. And uh, it's one of those books that uh, you can read, and you can profitably reread, and you can profitably go back again, because it's a, it's a dense, uh, deep, detailed book that warrants study. So I look forward to hearing, and we all should look forward to hearing from Professor Sullivan. And then we're going to hear from Michael Vorenberg, Professor of History at Brown University, the author of, among other things, um, the leading book on the 13th Amendment, a book titled uh, Final Freedom. Look forward very much to hearing from him, and I have a, a special <coughs> personal tie because his uncle was the dean of the Harvard Law School, and it was his uncle that got me in to uh, teaching. And uh, I've had a, a lot of fun doing that, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, Jim Hornberg, your uncle. So, without further ado, Margaret Burnham. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you so much, uh, Randy, my dear colleague Randy, and thank you uh, so much, uh, Pat Sullivan, for bringing us all together uh, for this occasion. It was a, a wonderful uh, talk last night, uh, generating lots of uh, thoughts about uh, the 14th Amendment, where it's, where it's been and uh, perhaps where it's going. Um, so I'm uh, delighted and thrilled and honored uh, to be part of this um, symposium. So we meet uh, to celebrate the 200th anniversary yeah. of the 14th Amendment, but uh, in point of fact, the amendment has really only been alive for maybe 60 or 70 years. Uh, so uh, the promise of the amendment uh, in, when it was adopted in 1868 was um, quickly interred uh, by the Supreme Court uh, in the uh, 19th century uh, and in the early 20th century. Uh, and it was not really until uh, the mid uh, 20th century uh, through the work of uh, Thurgood Marshall and others um, that the amendment began to uh, have some meaning for us. And of course, it is an amendment which uh, has continued to have uh, enormous meaning uh, and relevance and a long reach into our own time. Uh, my comments here really are, I want to address myself both to um, the reality that for that long period of time we didn't have a 14th Amendment. We, in effect, did not have a 14th Amendment. All of that our Supreme Court was doing uh, was throwing dirt on that amendment. Um, and then I want to suggest, and I hesitate to do so because we have here uh, the uh, author of the most important book on the 13th Amendment, um, but I do want to suggest um, that there might have been, uh, uh, that maybe there was a different choice that could have been made uh, when uh, our civil rights, um, our civil rights uh, advocates in the uh, 20th century um, chose to expand, to try to expand uh, and, uh, and, uh, and revive 
um, the 14th Amendment. Maybe they should have chosen the 13th Amendment. So that's, what, that's, that's my direction. Um, so first of all, as to the promise of the 14th Amendment, uh, Jacobus uh, Ten Book wrote a book in uh, 1948 called The Anti-Slavery Origins of the 14th Amendment. And there he argues that the uh, purpose of the 14th Amendment, the real purpose and goal of the framers of the amendment was protection of the laws, that that was the root value, the uh, essential value that the 14th Amendment uh, was uh, intended, uh, intended to secure. Uh, of course, we know it now as equal protection of the laws, uh, but initially this thought was um, that uh, we as citizens, we as residents of the country, uh, had a right to be protected uh, in our persons um, from violence, from racial violence, uh, and from other uh, efforts to subordinate us, uh, and that that was part of the contract that we made with government. Uh, that uh, in, in exchange for our our participation uh, and uh, and our, our, our membership uh, that this kind of protection was what what indeed was owed to us it was deemed to be considered in effect a natural right um, so that quickly gets buried of course we know now um, that it is it no longer the um, the the driving message of the 14th Amendment certainly not the driving theory of the 14th Amendment but it very quickly gets buried this notion protection of the laws gets quickly buried uh, by the Supreme Court. And in the first case, of course, U.S. versus Crookshank, a case decided in 1875, uh, wherein the court decided um, that there was no federal responsibility uh, to prosecute the uh, murderers of African-American would-be voters in the Colfax massacre. massacre. So, you know, very, very early on, uh, the Supreme Court takes the, takes the position that no, uh, the 14th Amendment is not about protection of the laws or equal protection of the laws, at least not with respect to the obligations of the federal government. Um, <clears throat> shortly um, after um, the, uh, the, the uh, 1875 decision, of course, as uh, Professor Kennedy mentioned uh, yesterday, um, the court in 1883, uh, in a case called the Civil Rights Act, uh, declares unconstitutional a congressional effort to breathe life into the 14th Amendment, the 18, uh, 18, uh, the, um, uh, excuse me, 1875 um, Civil Rights Act uh, becomes declared unconstitutional by virtue of the fact that um, there was no state presence or state action uh, involved uh, in what the uh, in, in in what those uh, seeking coverage of the 1875 Act um, sought to uh, sought to protect from, which in that case was uh, the right to uh, public decent public decent and equal uh, public accommodations. Um, so the court very quickly draws this line between what is state and what is private, a line that was not. Um, not anticipated, uh, nor in the minds of the framers of the 14th Amendment, and a line that has cobbled the implement implementation of the amendment ever since 1883, when the civil rights cases were actually decided. In 1890, um, the court decides um, that states are immune uh, from lawsuit uh, by virtue of the, uh, by virtue of the 11th, claiming to be by virtue of the 11th Amendment, but in fact continuing um, to insulate states uh, from federal, uh, from, uh, fed federal discipline uh, and from the intent of the 14th Amendment uh, to provide full and equal protection of the laws. In a case that is very little known in the Pantheon called Giles versus Alabama, decided in 1903, uh, so distinguished the judge as Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, wrote um, that, uh, that although uh, black voters might have a claim uh, that the efforts of Alabama to disenfranchise them by writing into its constitution a provision uh, requiring that they be, uh, that all voters except those who were grandfathered in be subjected to a literacy test 
thereby eliminating the potential uh, for any black participate, any black, uh, uh, any black electorate uh, to be established. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes says, "Well, that may be a problem, but there's nothing the federal government can do about it, notwithstanding um, the existence and role and place and inspiration for the 14th Amendment when it was adopted in 19, excuse me, in, in, in uh, 18, uh, 1868." Um, so finally. So we, there's this long period of time that is not actually broken until, 19, until the 1940s, Smith versus Allwright, when the court first begins to look at uh, the question, what really is state action, and can the state action doctrine from 1883 really interview, interfere with the federal efforts to uh, uh, pave a role uh, for black, particip black political participation? Ninth, that was the case, uh, Smith versus Sora decided in 1944. Uh, later in uh, 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 Shelley versus Kramer, 1948, the, the court again begins to look back at, um, at the state action problem uh, created in 18, uh, 1883, and similarly in a criminal case, Screws versus, uh, Screws versus uh, Georgia in, in 19. 45. So there's this long hiatus, long period of silence, uh, and, uh, and it's not, not silence, but uh, hostility uh, to the 14th Amendment um, that only, uh, gets, uh, only gets dislodged and only slightly dislodged uh, by, by, by the time we get into the 1940s. Um, so what the, what the 14th Amendment gives us, uh, rather than this notion um, that it's about the protection of law, it gives us this theory of classification, which was nowhere in the imagination of the framers of the 14th Amendment. This theory um, that equality is really just about whether people who are in the language of the law similarly situated have similar access to public goods. Nowhere in the context, and that is a, a theory um, that has created more havoc that I would suggest has not so much more havoc than good, but a lot of havoc. Uh, so, and it gets us to the point where ultimately, when those cases that those uh, leg that legislation, federal legislation, that should be uh, fully within the, 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 the footprint, within uh, the imprint, uh, within the message of the 14th Amendment, uh, for example, the 1964 um, Act uh, is not passed it, the 14th Amendment is not mentioned. Well, the 14th Amendment is not the driving force there. It's the Commerce Clause that is the driving force. Why? Because of these, this, the, the supreme, these successful Supreme Court uh, efforts um, to bury the amendment in its early life. So finally, what I suggest here is <clears throat> when um, Thurber and uh, his colleagues came uh, to the point of uh, a sufficient legal maturity in the 1930s, and late 30s and 1940s, uh, and began to think about what implements, what tools do we have in the Constitution? Clearly they looked in the direction of the 14th Amendment. And I argue they could have well, as well, looked in the direction of the 13th Amendment. Avoided the state action problem. No state action is required by the 13th Amendment. Uh, and built up a, a jurisprudence around the badges and incidents of slavery, which we know uh, from the framers of the 13th Amendment were more than chains. The badges and incidents con uh, concern all of what defined uh, slave life, uh, all of what defined the relationship uh, between whites and blacks for so long in our history. Um, these were the, and certainly in the 1940s, when we're looking at segregated schools, the badges and incidents were clear and, 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 and firmly in view. Those badges and incidents can be found uh, in, Phil in a Starbucks in Philadelphia. Where, you, where two folks can't get a cup of coffee. In New York City, where a guy is smothered to death and repeats nine times, I cannot breathe. In Minnesota, where Philandro Castro says, wait a minute, 
let me show you my gun before you shoot me to death. Tamir Brown, Michael, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown. Those are all the badges of inc and incidents of slavery. And had we built up that jurisprudence, perhaps we would be in a different place today. Thank you very much, Randy. Judge? Yes, if I could borrow that microphone. When Wadey's Waring took the oath of office as a United States District Judge at the Federal Courthouse in Charleston, South Carolina on January, January 26, 1942. No one present, including the judge himself, ever imagined that he would one day become a passionate advocate for racial justice. Indeed, his personal and family history would have suggested otherwise. The Warings were early settlers to the Carolina colony and multiple generations of his family were slaveholders. Judge Waring's father was a Confederate veteran. Prior to assuming his judicial duties, Waring had no known interest in racial issues. As, a judge later, as the judge later described his prejudicial views, we didn't give them any rights, but they never asked for any rights, and I didn't question it, end quote. Waring assumed his federal judgeship at a very dynamic moment in American history. The United States was at war with Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, and the war effort was promoted as a fight against intolerance, hatred, and fascism. Nearly one million African American soldiers were enlisted in the war effort, and many died in defense of American liberty. But at home, their families confronted the daily indignities of Jim Crow. There was at this time a discernible change in the attitude on civil rights issues by the United States Supreme Court, suggested by Professor Byrne just a moment ago. In the years following the adoption of the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th <coughs> Amendments, the federal courts consistently displayed an open hostility to the protection of black Americans, or the rights of black Americans. These culminated in the 1896 decision of Plessy versus Ferguson, upholding the doctrine of separate but equal, and the 1898 decision of Williams versus Mississippi, which sanctioned state legal devices that effectively disenfranchised black voters. In short, the federal courts were the place civil rights laws went to die. But the tide was beginning to turn with the 1938 decision Gaines versus Canada, in which the Supreme Court ruled that the state of Missouri was required to provide a separate but equal black law school or allow black applicants to be admitted to the all-white University of Missouri Law School. In a 1944 decision, Smith versus Allwright, the Supreme Court declared the Texas Democratic prim Party's uh, primary, all-white primary, unconstitutional. Judge Waring's first encounter with civil rights claims involved two teacher equal pay cases in Charleston in 1944. First in Charleston in 1944 and a second in Columbia in 1945. The Fourth Circuit in a 1940 decision, Alston versus City of Norfolk, declared unconstitutional a Virginia pay system <coughs> identical to South Carolina's teacher pay system. Despite this clear legal authority, South Carolina school districts continue to pay African American teachers a discriminatory wage. Waring found himself frustrated with the officious arguments of the school board lawyers trying to defend the plainly unlawful school district pay practices. Waring ordered the teacher pay equalized in both cases, which proved to be a, a not particularly controversial decision since he relied on the Plessy separate but equal doctrine in the Fourth Circuit's Alston decision. But Waring's experience with the equal pay cases made him realize that one day he might well have to confront civil rights issues far more difficult and controversial. And he privately wondered to himself whether he would, quote, dodge it or meet it, end quote. In the fall of 1946, Waring was assigned a criminal case brought by the United States Department of Justice against the police chief of Batesburg, South Carolina, Linwood Shaw who had beaten and blinded an African-American sergeant, Isaac Woodard, on the day of his discharge from the United States Army. The incident garnered nationwide attention, and the decision by the Justice Department to prosecute the police officer 
was prompted by the personal intervention of President Truman. The prosecution was widely denounced in South Carolina by elected officials and law enforcement officers. The Shell case was tried before an all-white federal jury in Columbia on November 5, 1946. Prior to the trial, Judge Waring was skeptical about the federal government's decision to prosecute a local police officer. But his views changed when he heard the highly credible and detailed testimony of the blinded sergeant, who described his arrest and vicious beating by Chief Shull. Waring had little doubt that Woodard was the victim of a brutal racial assault. But the jury acquitted Shull after only 28 minutes of deliberations. And Shull's supporters cheered the result. Few noticed the judge's wife, Elizabeth, who had attended the trial, leave the courtroom in tears. Judge Waring joined his wife later that evening at their hotel, and both were traumatized by the trial over which he had just presided. The Shaw trial forced the judge and his wife to stare directly into the southern racial abyss, a view that would forever transform both of them. Waring later described the Shaw trial as his personal baptism of fire and his Michigan-born wife's baptism in racial prejudice. The Waring's return to Charleston resolved to learn more about the issues of race and justice. These were not subjects that could be openly discussed among white Charlestonians of this era. The Waring's decided to undertake their own self-directed study, beginning with W.J. Cash's Mind of the South. Cash, a native-born white Southerner, described slavery as inescapably brutal and ugly and characterized Southern racial prejudice as a form of collective mental illness. Each evening, evening after dinner, Elizabeth would read a portion of Mind of the South out loud to allow the judge to rest his eyes after a day of handling his judicial duties. The couple that would then discuss what they had read, often while driving around Charleston in the evening, a favorite pastime. After completing Mind of the South, the Warings tackled a far more ambitious work. The 1,400 page study on race in America titled The American Dilemma. The study was funded by the Carnegie Foundation and authored by Swedish sociologist and economist Gunnar Myrdal, who would later be awarded the Nobel Prize. Myrdal was a great admirer of what he called the American Creed, which included the essential dignity of each individual, the equality of all people, and the right to freedom, justice, and fair opportunity. But Murdoch asserted there was a great gap between the American creed and America's treatment of its black citizens, which he described as a moral lag in the development of the nation. This gap, according to Murdoch, was America's dilemma. Murdoch was particularly critical of Southern gradualists, who he claimed were excessively timid and unwilling to confront the evils of Jim Crow segregation. After initially struggling with Murdoch's harsh critique of Southern race relations, uh, Wade is wearing fully embraced the message of the American dilemma. In 1947, George Elmore, a black Columbia businessman, filed suit in federal district court in Columbia, challenging the South Carolina Democratic Party's all-white primary. In the years following the Supreme Court's 1944 decision in the Texas white primary case, Every southern state but South Carolina agreed, at least officially, to allow African Americans to vote in the Democratic primary, then the only election that mattered in the South. South Carolina took a different approach, repealing all state laws regulating the party primary and claiming that the Democratic Party primary was a purely private affair beyond the jurisdiction of the federal courts. Waring was asked to preside over this highly controversial case he immediately appreciated the explosive nature of the case, but understood his choice was either, quote, to be entirely governed by the doctrine of white supremacy or to be a federal judge and decide the law, unquote. On July 12, 1947, Judge Waring issued his decision in Elmore versus Rice, declaring the South Carolina Democratic primary Party's white primary unconstitutional. Waring rejected the argument that the Democratic Party was a private club observing that private clubs do not vote and elect the President of the United States as members of the National <laughs> Congress. <laughs> Waring then concluded his order by declaring it is time for South Carolina to rejoin the Union and to adopt 
the American way of conducting elections. The Elmore decision was widely denounced by state officials who were confident it would be quickly reversed by the Fourth Circuit. They could not have been more wrong. The Fourth Circuit unanimously affirmed Waring's ruling, observing, quote, the disenfranchised can never speak with the same force as those who are able to vote, unquote. But party officials would not give up. Soon a new party rule was adopted, allowing blacks to vote in the party primary so long as they pledged to support racial segregation. A new suit was filed, and Judge Waring summoned all the members of the party's executive committee, all 92 of them, to his Charleston courtroom for an emergency hearing. He denounced their efforts to defy his earlier ruling and explained that a federal judge faced with contempt could impose a fine or a jail sentence. He wanted those present to know that if there were any future violations, there would be no fines. <laughs> the response of South Carolina segregationists was thunderous. Death threats, written and oral, were constant. A cross was burned in the Waring's residence, at the Waring's residence, and bricks were thrown through their living room window. On the order of the United States Attorney General, U.S. Marshals provided Waring 24-hour security. Time Magazine described Waring as the man they loved to hate, but also noted he was a man of cool courage. Judge Waring let it be known he would be in his office on primary day, August 10, 1948, prepared to issue contempt citations and jail any person who disrupted the election process. The voting was orderly, even festive, with 35,000 African Americans voters patiently waiting in line to cast their ballots. The morning following the primary, Waring wrote Fourth Circuit Chief Judge John J. Parker, telling him, quote, the primary went off smoothly yesterday, and they didn't shoot me. <laughs> if the purpose of the unprecedented vilification of Waring was intended to cower him, it did not work. Instead, he continued his study and reflection on race and justice in America, and became convinced that the foundation of Jim Crow segregation, the Supreme Court's 1896 decision in Plessy versus Ferguson, was legally, historically, and morally wrong. Waring, then approaching 70 years of age and likely retirement, resolved to play a role in overturning the separate but equal doctrine. Waring developed an elaborate plan to place a school desegregation case onto the docket of the United States Supreme Court, firmly convinced that the Supreme Court would overturn Plessy if the justices were forced to directly confront the issue. He noted on his trial docket a case from Clarendon County, South Carolina, Briggs versus Elliott, which sought to equalize the facilities of black and white schools, a classic Plessy claim. When the plaintiff's attorney, Thurgood Marshall, appeared at the Charleston Courthouse on November 17, 1950, for a pretrial conference on his case, which is again just three days later, he was advised that the judge wanted to see him in his office. After being ushered into Waring's office, the judge told Marshall he did not want to try, quote, another separate but equal case. Bring me a frontal attack on segregation, end quote. A stunned marshal told Waring, this is on our agenda. It's just not tonight. We don't think this is the case. We don't think this is the time. Waring was unpersuaded, telling Marshall, this is the case. This is the time. Marshall urged the judge to think practically, noting that any decision by him overturning Plessy would be reversed by the Fourth Circuit. Waring explained that since the challenge to public school segregation contested the constitutionality of a state law, he would request the appointment of a three-judge panel in which he would sit. Marshall then responded that they would lose two to one in the three-judge panel. <laughs> Waring agreed, but noted that any appeal from a three-judge panel went directly to the United States Supreme Court and automatically went onto the docket, and he told Marshall, that's where you want to be. <laughs> Waring's strategy was bold but risky and conflicted with the deliberate litigation strategy of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and carefully built one legal precedent on top of another, never trying to get ahead of the Supreme Court. A few minutes after this dramatic encounter, Waring convened the pretrial conference in Briggs and publicly pressed Marshall and whether he was prepared to challenge the constitutionality of public school segregation. Marshall stated he was and agreed to dismiss his pending case 
and refiled Briggs versus Elliott as the first frontal attack of public school segregation in American history. The case was tried in the Charleston Federal Courthouse in May 1951 before a three-judge panel consisting of Fourth Circuit Chief Judge John Parker and District Judges Timmerman and Waring. In prior years, civil rights cases in the South were sparsely attended by members of the black community, lest it be, they be identified as members of the NAACP or otherwise as troublemakers. But on the morning of May 28, 1951, as the sun rose in Charleston, African Americans lined up at the federal courthouse and down Broad Street as far as the eye could see. Judge Waring observed the massive, massive crowd from his office window, later describing the scene as a breath of freedom. Those in attendance in the courtroom were not disappointed by the performance of Thurgood Marshall and his trial team. The trial included the testimony of Dr. Kenneth Clark, a social psychologist who had done groundbreaking research on the effects of segregation using black and white dolls. Such social science testimony had never been offered in an American courtroom. The crowd was also entertained by Marshall's devastating cross-examination of the state's key witness, whose last name was ironically Crow. One observer referenced the state's renowned lead attorney, Bob Figg, stating, Mr. Figg got his law degree when he finished law school, but he just got his baccalaureate address from Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> As Waring predicted, the majority of the panel ruled that South Carolina's laws mandating segregated schools were lawful under the Plessy Doctrine and ordered that the obviously unequal black and white schools in Clarendon County be equalized. But Waring was fully, but Waring, fully aware he was writing a dissent for the ages, wrote an elegant and brilliant attack on the foundations of segregation in America, concluding, quote, segregation in education can never produce equality, and it is an evil that must be eradicated. Segregation in education adopted and practiced in the state of South Carolina must go and go now. Segregation is per se inequality. Waring's dissent was the first challenge to public school segregation by a federal judge since Plessy's decision 55 years earlier. In early 1952, some six months after the Great Dissent, <coughs> Waring announced his retirement as a federal judge and moved to New York City. Waring followed closely later school desegregation cases filed in Virginia, Delaware, and Kansas, all which were consolidated before the United States Supreme Court with Briggs under the title Brown versus Board of Education. And all the other school desegregation cases involving 14 different judges, only ways Waring had ruled that public school segregation, even if the facilities were equal, violated the 14th Amendment. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court handed down unanimously its landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education. The court cast aside the separate but equal doctrine and adopted the per se rule that all government mandated public school segregation was unconstitutional, first advanced by Waring in his Briggs dissent. Shortly after the Brown decision, Waring had a private discussion with Chief Justice Earl Warren, who had authored the Brown decision. Waring told Warren how much he admired the court's clear-cut order and humorously observed, I felt greatly relieved when you decided the Clarendon school case. I've been pretty lonely up to that time. <laughs> the Chief Justice responded, ladies, well, you had to do it the hard way. Waring was always philosophical about what he called the unpleasant repercussions of his civil rights decisions. In an oral history late in life, Waring observed, taking the whole thing in balance, I think I'm enormously fortunate because you don't often in life have the opportunity to do something you really think is good. I think it's a great stroke of fortune. A, a great stroke of fortune came down my alley. The other penalties don't amount to anything. They're offset by what I think is a really important contribution to the history of our country. Thank you. Amen. Thank you all for coming here, and I want to thank again my colleague and co-pilot, uh, Robin Waits. We kind of dreamed this up about a year ago, and it's really wonderful uh, to see it all come together, and it's been just a great pleasure working with her to do that. Um, so uh, the title of our symposium is Reconstruction's Legacy, 
Uh, and last night, uh, President Kennedy got us off to a, to a great start uh, in how we think about this history and reminded us, in addition to exploring the past, we're involved in history making. Um, and he spoke a bit about the legal and community efforts that, and he used the, the term, you know, breathe, breathe life into the 14th Amendment. And reminded us to think about um, what it took. You know, a, a, a cases just don't appear. You know, plaintiffs and lawyers kind of bring these cases forward, as we've heard. And he also suggested that in, in exploring this history, uh, we, it eliminates the workings of racism in this country. Uh, and I think uh, Margaret Burnham, again, started us off this morning with a real painful reminder of what's been lost over decades uh, while this amendment really lay dormant. Um, so today, uh, I want to talk a bit uh, about um, a person, Charles Hamilton Houston, who my students know, <laughs> I talk a lot about. But I keep learning from him. I mean, these historical figures, we just keep learning from them. And he, I would argue, was the architect of the legal insurgency. Well, it was litigation. It was community, it was movement <laughs> uh, that brought us what we heard last night was Brown, which was the most important <coughs> case decided. Uh, he was deceased by the time Brown came, but his work, it, it, it's just unimaginable uh, that it, we could have begun to break open and break through what uh, Professor Burnham described without his vision, and his efforts. Um, the climate within which he began to work, I just went briefly, uh, you know, conditions in the South, uh, you reading that Green Book Ordinance last night was so uh, telling. I mean, you know, segregation was so uh, forced, enforced through law and of course through terror and violence. Um, it uh, mandated throughout the South and it had the imprimatur of the country. You know, there's a uh, editorial in the New York Times in 1915 where they commented that the 15th Amendment was a blunder in statesmanship. It attempted to thwart by legislation a determination that has never been thwarted in the history of the human race, the determination of the white man to rule the land where he lives. Uh, and so this period leading up to when I'm going to begin with uh, Mr. Houston at the end of the 20s, um, you know, Segregation, the southern system of terror and violence was accepted, endorsed, and increasingly applied in the rest of the country uh, as black migration to the north and west really steadily transformed the racial landscape of America. Kelly Miller commented in 1929, the color line in public education is vigorously asserting itself across the continent from Atlantic City to Los Angeles. So this is a climate within which Charles Hamilton Houston began his work. Uh, he was transformed by his experience uh, in the segregated armed forces during World War I. During the war, he later recalled, I made up my mind that if luck was with me and I got through this war, I would study law and use my time fighting for men who could not strike back. Shortly after returning home to Washington, D.C., uh, whites rioted, attacked black property, and lies for three days, and everything was just fought back. It was, uh, turning point there. Um, so this is the climate where he leaves his, his hometown to go up to Harvard to study law. And his, uh, he begins to pay attention on what it will take to tackle racism in this country and breathe life into the Reconstruction uh, Era amendments. And he concluded, there must be Negro lawyers in every community, and the great majority will come from Negro schools, where the training will be in the hand of Negro teachers. Um, so how to do this, great idea, right? So he uh, obtained a grant from the uh, Laura Spellman Rockefeller Foundation that was, uh, came through Howard where he was lecturing. And he conducted, in 1927, a comprehensive study of the status of black lawyers and the state of black legal education in the United States and made his first trip to the South. He was a field organizer. He's an early Bob Moses. I told about that. I mean, he went. He just went into the field. So before I mean, he gathered information from Howard alumni, he corresponded with county clerk's offices and bar associations. He did research in the Library of Congress. And then and he went into the field. He went to major cities around the country and over the course of two months visited 17 southern cities and surrounding rural areas in 10 
southern states. Um, I want to read a little bit from his report back. I tried to expose myself to every experience within the range of Negro life. I have been in the mills, theaters, churches, courts, schools, <coughs> jails, insane asylums, docks, farms, gambling houses, and every place I could get into. I have walked the field with an industrial insurance agent, and I have been with a doctor on his calls. And then he focused special attention in this report back on the relationship between blacks and the police, describing widespread fear and distrust among black communities towards law enforcement officials. As a reference point, Houston noted in his report that during the 1919 race riot in Washington, quote, <coughs> the police were more vicious in beating up the Negroes than the white mob, attacking them uh, and arresting innocent Negroes by the wholesale. He found that the police in various cities he visited sporadically instituted campaigns of violence against the Negro population and made arrests at the slightest provocation. In Birmingham, New Orleans, and Atlanta, Quote, the police have unwritten curfews for Negroes. Birmingham was especially notorious. Police would stop and question any Negro found on the streets after midnight. Quote, the usual procedure is to flash a gun on the Negro and order him to put up his hands and question him afterwards. If he hesitates, he is dead. The policeman appears at the inquest and swears the Negro made a hip pocket motion and he was afraid of his life. His partner substantiates him. For all such policemen work at night in pairs. The Negro's lips are sealed. The coroner finds justifiable homicide, another Negro dead. Now for me, this reads like the Kernan Commission report. And there's a wonderful, the, the, the part of the Kernan Commission report that was suppressed, Harvest of American Racism, uh, which is based on investigations in I think 23 cities. Uh, the people wrote it, they described similar, and they were all fired. And the report was suppressed. It's being published by the University of Michigan uh, this summer. Robert Shallow, who was the lead social scientist, uh, edited it. So look for that. But this was striking. So he's getting a real close view of what the challenges are going to be and what people will face when they step up to this. So based on the research, what he, he found that there, he estimated there are barely 100 lawyers practicing uh, in the South. Roughly half of them were correspondence school lawyers. 90% of the rest have been trained at non-accredited black institutions, and they weren't prepared to meet the chronic social, political, and legal needs of the black community. So at a time when 80, roughly 87% of black Americans lived in the South, where there was not the vote, he just concluded the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were tools for cracking Jim Crow. They gave them room for experimentation, and I think, you know, that's what I learned in writing this NAC book. People think they had precedent. No, they were creative, improvisational, you know, plaintiffs, communities that have pulled them in different directions. Uh, but they had a focus. Um, and it was to enable black people to enforce, to force reforms through litigation where they could not, where they could have no chance through politics. And black lawyers were of unquestionable importance to this effort. Uh, and, and, and then he also concluded in his report that those who would make a commitment to working in the South, and it's sort of like Du Bois in 1946 who's emphasizing you have to work in the South, come South, would most likely be trained in a black law school. So this underscored the whole purpose of his study, which was to get Howard accredited and really invest uh, funds to make it a first-rate law school. Um, and based on this report, that happened. Howard was accredited, uh, had been an unaccredited night school, which Houston's father had attended, mostly serving government, federal uh, government workers. And it was accredited, full-time, day program, hired uh, excellent faculty, and would produce some of the top <coughs> constitutional lawyers in this country, including Thurgood Marshall, who was a 1933 graduate of Howard. Houston described uh, these lawyers as soldiers who would carry on the actual battles in the courtroom and serve as advisors to the people. That's his vision. So what you see is he has legal brilliance, and we know that. I mean, Thurgood Marshall was in the house last night. Brilliant, but that wasn't enough. They had to be connected and linked with these communities um, around the South, because those are the people, as Robert Carter would tell us, I leave and go back to New York, they stay there. 
these are the people making the risks, the George L. Moores and, and all these people uh, throughout the South. So fusing these efforts together and um, facing up to a racial caste system reinforced through violence and terror. Um, in 34, he became legal counsel of the NASB sort of by accident, because uh, the white man they hired uh, to work in the Roosevelt administration. And this was, for him, clearly uh, central to the next step in realizing his vision. And again, I just want to emphasize this, going into the field, the first thing he did in November with his student, former student, Edward Lovett, was to get in a car and drive to the southeast. He met with students at 13 black colleges, conferred with NAACP branches and teachers groups, spoke to community meetings, addressed the North Carolina Conference of Tobacco Workers Union, attended the district conference of the AME Episcopal Church. And his major, and investigated the deal programs, and his major focus was on black education, the state of black education. And a number of you are familiar with the film he made of conditions in the state. You know, county by county, the black school, often a shack, you know, was you know, just terrible, They're broken down, they pay for a teacher, that was it. And then you go to the white school, a brick, two-story, you know, basketball, who's about side. And he made this film, and a student of mine did research on it, and according to what she's found, it's the first documentary, documentary film made by an African-American. So check that out, see if we're wrong, but if you can find anybody else who's made a documentary like that. Um, so this is breathing life into the 14th Amendment. And I think what's notable, and I'm thinking of Margaret's parents, that he, he began his work, his work coincides with the beginning of one of the most dynamic and expansive political eras in American history. Uh, and he was aware of that. He, to him, the Scottsboro case was a huge turning point in the struggle. The ILD took two cases to the Supreme Court where the 14th Amendment was applied to the rights of the accused. So you had that effort going on. You had a resurgent labor movement. Uh, you had um, expansive federal government with people making demands on the federal government. And you had youth activism, people like Dorothy and Louis Burnham, Esther Jackson, and James Jackson. So, it's, you know, so he started, but he has this fertile environment and he's very much interacting with it. And, and, and really, this legal insurgency takes root. It's really important to realize it takes root during the 1930s. People always want to start with World War II. They discount the intellectual capital that these lawyers bring and the works in these communities and the kind of work that people on the left, labor people, not a mass movement yet, but really the yeast, I, I, I would say. Um, and uh, and his <coughs> vision, his confidence, is sort of reflected in what he says in 1935. He writes to a friend and talks about these younger lawyers who, who come south. Thurgood Marsh is working in the south, Oliver Hills back in Virginia, and uh, a number who've been trained at Howard, a handful. And he said, these uh, young people saw their future in a different light. They embraced, quote, the opportunity for service and accepted the risks of working on a social frontier. And then he added, the possibilities are limitless for young Negroes who are willing to make the risk. As he saw it, and I love telling my students this, the Negro lawyer in the South, in the next 25 years, has a chance to reconstruct the entire Southern picture. 25 years. What year was this? 1935. He's just about right. 1960, the sit-ins were coming down the home stretch of this chapter of the civil rights struggle. Um, so he said that in 35. And, um, so the lawyers, but first and foremost, he saw civil rights litigation as an organizing tool that would arouse and strengthen the will of local communities to fight for their rights. He said, we cannot start until the community is ready. And I think you underscored that last night about the plaintiffs, the people who would step up. And they would step up, as uh, Chris Katie mentioned last night, about the Briggs, you know, they were willing to risk everything, everything. And when they signed that petition, our friend Robert Carter came down to make sure they understood that. You could be killed. If you haven't lost your job yet, you'll lose it. And he said they continued on. Uh, why? Because they felt things could change. And they felt things could change with that Thurgood Marshall and this, this group of attorneys working with them in tandem. Uh, and, and that is called breathing life into the 14th Amendment. Um, so, I mean, the struggle carried forward by these community lawyers, uh, the communities and lawyers, it's sort of the machinery of the civil rights movement is in place. And what happens as we get through the, to the post-war period and the Cold War begins, 
And what's, of course, the legal struggle continues on, but in a much narrower frame, right? And Houston is very aware of that he's defending people brought up under the loyalty order when he, when he dies in 1950. So he's working across the broad front. And but the beauty of the, the league, it's sort of this insurgency is under until Brown. I mean, after, after Smith v. Allwright, there was a reaction. But Brown, as Brown comes on the horizon, you get the pushback. But up until that time, it's, um, it's pretty, uh, it moves forward uh, fairly without lots of opposition. Uh, and certainly not like what people um, <coughs> involved in the SNYC and Southern Conference and the, and the left unions experienced. Um, so uh, I just, and, and I guess when we think about uh, what this struggle brings, and we'll hear more about it this afternoon, I mean that the Brown decision and what follows in its wake, I mean this struggle is for all Americans. I mean, you know, that all have race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, it opens up federal protection of citizenship for um, for so many, and again, as you point, we're in the process where history making, I mean, you know, the 14th Amendment is very much uh, in play and uh, and uh, challenging us. But but I think you're reading his report about policing practices um, in 1927, uh, and, and, and as, as Professor Burnham, her, her litany, um, it's so present, right? And so the racial dimension of this struggle is, you know, the change that these lawyers and communities have brought to the country, but also what they magnify in the process of, of the deep nature of the challenge. And uh, I want to read a, sh a short quote from James Baldwin uh, in a speech he gave that sort of captures the, the nature of, you know, what they did, how they saw it, and, and sort of leap of faith. Uh, he was talking to black teachers about a month after the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, and it's a terrific speech. If anyone would like a copy, email me, I'll send it to you. But he said, the obligation of anyone who thinks of himself as responsible is to examine society, to examine society and try to change it and to fight it at no matter what risk. This is the only hope society has, and this is the only way societies change. And I think that's a great lesson of this history and challenge to us today. Uh, I also want to uh, thank the South Carolina History Center and the History Department at USC and, and USC itself and, and, at, and uh, for helping to organize this. So we are proceeding a bit backwards uh, chronologically, but I think that's actually going to end up being a good thing. This is a symposium about the 14th Amendment, which was, adopt it was sent to the states in 1866. Uh, it was adopted by ratification in 1868, 150 years ago. And I'm here to talk about, I think, the context of those years of the adoption and early enforcement of the 14th Amendment. Last night, Professor Kennedy gave a wonderful talk about the second Reconstruction. A lot of us may be wondering, what about the first Reconstruction? And I guess that's, um, I'm going to try to do that in about five or ten minutes. Uh, <laughs> so 1935, W.E. Du Bois publishes uh, Black Reconstruction in America. At lunchtime today, we'll be privileged to hear from uh, Professor David Lewis about Du Bois. In 1988, uh, Eric Foner publishes his uh, grand book on Reconstruction, very much in the spirit of Du Bois. Uh, I will say that if you would like to know more about the history of Reconstruction, please do not depend just on me and the short words I have here, but turn to those two great books. And of course, there's much scholarship afterwards. What I'm going to do here is just to give some historical reflections uh, about the uh, period of the end of the Civil War, early Reconstruction, to, if you will, recreate the climate in which these things were done. Uh, Professor Burnham has given an excellent short history of the way in which the Supreme Court 
throws dirt on the 14th Amendment, very good expression, buries the 14th Amendment uh, in the late 1800s, and we know that story well. I think the danger in emphasizing that story, which has to be known and does have to be emphasized, is that we can sometimes uh, forget the story that came before, uh, before it was buried by the Supreme Court, when it really was um, the 14th Amendment uh, a crucial and understood to be a crucial foundation of a new nation uh, devoted to civil rights. First thing I'll mention is that you need to understand the 14th Amendment as part of a larger package of congressional le legislation and, of course, the other Reconstruction Amendments. Two years before the 14th Amendment is adopted, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 is adopted. It's funny, when we, I, I keep on hearing this phrase, the Civil Rights Act, and what we're talking about there is 1964. Historians like myself, I'm a student scholar of the Civil War and Reconstruction, when we talk about the Civil Rights Act, we're talking about 1866. And, uh, and I, the, the 1866 Act has been, does not exist as it was. Uh, pieces still do and are still in the federal code, and lawyers in the room can speak to that. The 66 Act is passed to enforce the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery. And uh, Professor Burnham mentioned, and maybe we'll get to talk about a bit more. So the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery, has, does other things, has a second clause that says Congress shall enforce by appropriate legislation. So the first piece of legislation that it does that, really the only one, is the 1866 Act, which President Andrew Johnson vetoes. It is then overridden. But that signals that we need more than just an act. We need an amendment, right? Uh, actually, that was already known. So the same Congress that passes the act passes the 14th Amendment. I want to, uh, so understanding the 14th Amendment, you actually have to pair it with the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And I want to read to you some pieces of this act. It's a remarkable piece of legislation. This is just a year after uh, General Lee has surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox. And that act, um, among other things, it has the language of the 14th Amendment that establishes what we call birthright citizenship. Uh, that is, if you're born in this country, you are immediately a citizen, or you can also be a citizen through naturalization. That piece of the 14th Amendment, by the way, we haven't talked about much, and I'm not going to say much, I'll just point out that it's rather important in today's politics, uh, the politics of citizenship and birthright. So that for the anti uh, immigration nativist politics uh, that we are in the midst of yet again, they are completely stymied by this problem, in their eyes, of birth, of people who are born in this country. And thus, every now and then you hear one of these people say, maybe we should have hearings about the 14th Amendment and think about that citizenship clause, the birthright clause. And the, the, the Civil Rights Act of 66 has that language around birth. Then it talks about civil rights. It re, uh, repeats the language of the 13th Amendment, talks about certain rights that are entailed, most of have to do with property, holding, uh, and, but then comes to law and says that, uh, that the citizens and persons um, will have full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of person and property. Let me say that again full and equal benefit. Not just equal, but full. Now they don't say what full means, but I think it's worth thinking about what full benefit means. Anyway, full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of person and property as is enjoyed by white citizens. This is a remarkable move. They set the standard, they set the standard, Congress does, of full and equal by saying, look at the most legally enfranchised members of society, white citizens, and then say that everyone must have what they have. It acknowledges race directly. It acknowledges white privilege directly. For those of you who think that white privilege, you know, we hear this in the media, that white privilege is a phrase of the politically correct, et cetera, et cetera. This is the Congress of the United States saying directly that white privilege exists, and then saying, and the job now is to bring everyone else to that level. 
That's what the Civil Rights Act of 66, that's the promise. And it says that people who violate it shall be subject to the punishment, pains, and penalties, et cetera, et cetera. The 14th Amendment now takes the spirit of that and puts it into a constitutional amendment. And it goes further. Because not only does it put that in the spirit, the, it puts it in the enforcement of how this is going to be done. The Civil Rights Act of 66 has in it military provisions that empower the president to call out the army, among other things, to make sure that these things are done. Now I can say more about those provisions, um, but I won't for the moment. The enforcement of the 14th Amendment, which comes first in, um, a number of enforcement acts are passed in 1870, 71, 72. Most of those have to do with enforcing voting rights under the 15th Amendment. But the 1871 Act, also called the Ku Klux Klan Act, is specifically to enforce the 14th Amendment. And it repeats effectively the spirit of using the military to do what the Civil Rights Act of 66 promises. And it does it. Uh, that is, the military under President Grant um, will be called out, um, so, so the 71 Act has only a two-year life, that is Congress gives two years to do this, uh, to enforce it. And it empowers the President to suspend habeas corpus rights, that is to basically dictate martial law in order to enforce this. That suspension of habeas corpus is done in only one state, South Carolina. Uh, because it is in South Carolina where, in the investigation of civil rights abuses under the Klan, uh, that some of the most egregious examples are found, especially in York County in the north part of the state. And so the habeas corpus is uh, suspended in York County and many other counties. There are arrests of hundreds of Klan members, there are trials of many, and hundreds of Klan members leave to avoid prosecutions. Now let's not applaud too heavily because, of course, many of these Klan members will be back in the state in just a few years, and then, as Professor Burnham has said, the Supreme Court will lead the way in sort of making sure that this sort of thing uh, doesn't happen again. But for not just a moment, but a rather significant period of history, a set of years, you have a 14th Amendment and an enforcement regime that is extraordinarily powerful uh, in doing this. And I mention this also because let us not forget the context of war, the Civil War. The way we tell the story is that the war ends, Lee surrenders to Grant, that Appomattox, and then there's Reconstruction. I want to, I'm, partly because I'm working on a book on the end of the Civil War, and you say, well, is the Civil War over actually? I'm actually, that's a reasonable question, and my book deals with that. I actually begin with the fact that the war legally is not over, not even close to over, at Appomattox. The technical end date, the legal end date of the end of the Civil War is August 20th, 1866, 14 months after Appomattox. That is to say that the Civil Rights Act of 66, the 14th Amendment, when it's sent to the states, all of this is happening when the U.S. is in a state of war. So these military provisions are hugely important. To understand that it was not only legally expected, but obligated that the president at that time would bring out the military. The president at that time is Andrew Johnson, the last person who was going to bring out the military, which is why Congress had to do it themselves to pass acts that effectually try to transfer power over the military to themselves, away from the president, which is ultimately what Andrew Johnson will challenge and what will get him impeached. Andrew Johnson, a president unlike any other, who regards himself as the man of the people, who's the first president to leave the White House to go on a speaking tour against legislation. He loves popular rallies. <laughs> See if this sounds familiar. Uh, and so he goes on what becomes known as a swing around the circle in August of 1866. Uh, why? To denounce the 14th Amendment, 
to urge states not to ratify it. And in the midst, once he starts speaking, he can't help himself. All sorts of kinds of things comes out of his mouth, <laughs> saying things like, you want to talk about hanging traitors, by which he means Confederates, why not hang some of these northern radical abolitionists? Why not hang Thaddeus Stevens, he says. <laughs> so, you know, he, once he gets going, he, it's hard to stop him. He always regarded himself as a true Democrat, the true man of the people. And if you're looking for a precedent to our current president, there is no better than Andrew Johnson. I'll make this case over and over again. Um, anyway, Johnson does not win. The 14th Amendment is adopted over his urging that it is not. Johnson is impeached. And you have before you a golden age potential of the 14th Amendment. And for a few years, it's there. So let us not forget that. That golden age is not forgotten by many voices in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s, including, of course, famously Justice John Harlan in his dissent in Plessy. But I'll end by talking about another of Harlan's dissent, which I find even more powerful, the dissent in 1883 in the civil rights cases. So which Professor Burnham mentioned. So the other Enforcement Act of the 14th Amendment is passed in 1875. It does not have a time limit. That is, it's for all time. It goes much further than anything. It makes no distinction between private state actor and private. It imposes civil penalties against private actors who discriminates. And as the historian John Hope Franklin wrote, uh, some years ago, he got into the courts and showed how this was actually being used in the courts, the 75 Act, uh, in these few years that it existed for private prosecutions uh, the, under the 14th Amendment. And then in 1883, eight years after it's adopted, the Supreme Court reviews it and strikes it down in this famous and infamous case, the Civil Rights Act uh, cases. In dissent, Harlan talks about not just the 14th Amendment, but the 13th Amendment very vividly about the spirit of a war to end slavery and the spirit to keep that war in mind and what the war was about to end slavery, not just chattel slavery, but the badges and incidents of slavery. In the majority opinion, Justice, Justice Joseph Bradley talks about this line of reasoning and he dismisses it out of hand. He says, look, if you go down this road to justify civil rights on the basis of a remedy to slavery, the badges of incidents, he says, and I quote, you run the slavery argument into the, this, if we keep on doing this, you run the slavery argument into the ground. He says, and we should, that just makes no sense. And to you I say, why not? Why not run the slavery argument as far as it will go? Because that's what Harlan said to do. It's what the framers of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments sought to do, which is to say, let us examine slavery historically, as is being done. Let us examine the badges and incidents that are the legacy of slavery and are with us today. And let us think about these laws, whether they are civil rights acts or constitutional amendments, as what they were primarily uh, intended to do, which was to remedy slavery as the cause of the war and to effectively end the Civil War because the war had not ended yet. Thank you. We have a few minutes for uh, questions. Fascinating. Your talk last night. I just wonder, though. You talk about when you talk about Brown versus Board and the desire of making the Supreme Court do a you know majority opinion, and you suggest that it might have been better if they had made a more forceful decision. But I think we. And you, you wait, we need to think about the time that this decision is made. And you're all relating to this. And that is that the white community didn't want to hear it. Especially in the South, but in the nation as a whole. They didn't really want to get rid of segregation. 
So they were making a huge leap to make this decision that had been ignored for 60 years. And suddenly, here's a, a decision that's so radical for the time that they were very fearful if they made a, mu a more aggressive decision, the country could explode, potentially. So while I, I think we still have that problem, obviously you both made that clear, and I agree that we're still confronting the issues of slavery and segregation. And we're now at the point where we really, I know we need to have sort of a reconciliation commission like South Africa had, I think. I think it's, it's, it's very necessary, but too many people, particularly in the white, well, in the white community, still can't deal with it. I mean, in 1989, when I was working on what a rather uh, an exhibit about slavery, and I talked about the fact that slavery was nothing but hard work and, and, and uh, destruction to people, I got people writing me letters saying, how could you say such a thing? That we, we're, uh, you know, slavery was a benevolent institution. This is in 1989. So we still have, I'm afraid, a lot of people in not only the South, but other parts of the country that still can't deal with the reality of what slavery was. And scholarship is very clear on what it was all about. But the average Joe, for the most part, still can't deal with it. And the question ultimately is, how do we make people deal with it? Excuse me, if you say that slavery was a benevolent institution. What I'm trying to say is I got a letter from someone in the public trying to argue in 1989 that slavery was a benevolent institution. It's, it's, it grows out of the fact, first of all, that people, the white community particularly, does not understand African history and the very complex and amazing things that happen in Africa. They see Africa as a barbaric continent. It's, it's another problem with the lack of historical context that we have here. And so I'm, what I'm trying to say is that's still an issue to a lot of people in the white community. They still can't understand how brutal slavery was in many ways. And I don't think our educational system has done a very good job overall to try to show what slavery really was all about. So I think Professor Kennedy last night was making the point that uh, 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 Chief Justice Warren's commitment to a unanimous decision uh, didn't get him what he thought it would get him. He thought uh, Warren wanted a unanimous decision because he thought that would bring the country around. And clearly it didn't bring the country around. And so the, his point, I think his point was that the costs, you know, the costs were really not worth the candle here or the mixing metaphors. Uh, but in effect, uh, a dissenting opinion or a, a, a divided court uh, would have allowed members of that court, and in this case it would have been Warren, who eventually in 1968 does introduce the word white privilege, white supremacy, into the lexicon of Supreme Court opinions in a case called Loving versus Virginia, that Warren could have spoken in those terms in 1954, were he not so committed to a unanimous decision, which didn't get him what he thought he wanted. I, I, I'm not, I don't want to speak for our moderator, but I think that's where he was going there. Well, I, I, you know, I, I agree with you to some degree, but I'm trying to think of what Warren would have been thinking about in 1954 when he had to make this radical decision. And I, you know, he, we now realize, I think, that he made a mistake, but at the time, he felt that if he had a majority opinion, the nation would accept the fact that all these uh, legal minds had thought together and won, and they would accept it. Can I say just two things? One, to come, to come back to a point that I made last night and I'd like to make again, given our setting, the importance of history, the importance of what we're up to. So you talked about what people were taught. I went to a very fine school, St. Albans School for Boys, great school. I clearly remember in the 11th grade taking advanced placement history 
The textbook we used was Samuel Eliot Morrison's History of the American People. Samuel Eliot Morrison was a legendary professor at Harvard University, real big shot in the history profession. Uh, profession. In the middle of the book, when we got to slavery, the beginning of the chapter, and I remember it very vividly, the first line was, and now for Sambo. Okay. Now, the view was, to get back to the lead, that's right, the view was, until fairly recently, it wasn't until Kenneth Stamp, Kenneth Stamp in the 1960s, this was, now among, no, be, be careful here, in the Journal of Negro History, the truth was told. Oh, so, you know, let's, so it wasn't, it wasn't, everybody had this ridiculous notion of slavery as a benevolent institution, a school for civilization. But within the history profession generally, that's right, the idea was that slavery was a benevolent institution, and does, is that still part of our culture? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And you see it all around. And that's why we're going to have to continue to have meetings just like we're having today. Second thing, now here I'm going to go against interest. I'm a lawyer. That's how I pay my mortgage. <laughs> Lawyers, judges, real important. But let's not go overboard. You know, people talk about Brown versus, Brown versus Board of Education, very important, 1954, landmark. Um, 1948, Harry S. Truman passes an executive order and gets going with the desegregation of the armed forces. I think lawyers, frankly, I think that the Supreme Court generally gets too much attention paid to it. I think it's a very important institution, but it's not like... You know, it's just them. There are a lot of things happening in society that are extremely important. I mean, the desegregation of the armed forces, Fort Jackson, Fort Jackson, I mean, really quite extraordinary. You have segregation entrenched in South Carolina, but at Fort Jackson, you have the beginnings of desegregation. So, you know, again, I think that the legal materials are important, uh, the cases are important, but there are other things going on, and we, sh we, we ought to be attentive to those as well. Sports, I mean, if you're going to talk about the history of desegregation and events after World War II, Jackie Robinson has to be part of that story. Extremely important. Uh, don't forget Larry Yogan. He was from here. Yeah. And you know, and, and, and you know, events in literature, events in music. Um, the courts are important. Not the only thing going on. Can I say one thing about the courts? Um, they're important not just for winning cases. I mean, the process of getting there. You know, the, the, the psychological. No, and I think that was Houston's contribution. You know, winning, it was not winning, winning, it was working in these communities where Margaret writes about justice rights. I mean, about people, they, people knew they were citizens, but how do you make the claim? You know, going to court, breaking down the psychological barriers and taking the risk, I mean, risking. I mean, you know, when people sat in, in 1960, you know, those guys in Greensboro said, well, you know, Brown, I mean, Brown meant something because they were still, they didn't want to live this, you know, under segregation. That Brown was sort of a benchmark. King and Montgomery, if we're wrong, the Supreme Court is wrong. If we're wrong, so the actual decisions, and the, I agree about that, the judge and the decisions, but I think the process of creating a conscious, I mean, not, people knew they were citizens, be able to act on it, and making the courtroom an arena where they'd come over here and they'd see Thurgood Marshall argue a case. I mean, Robert Carter talked about in Jackson, Mississippi. They watched him argue a case in 1948. The school superintendent uh, started to ask him questions. He said, no, I'm the lawyer, you're the witness, you answer my questions. And the judge said, he's correct. And he found out later, they reenacted that scene in barbershops, pool halls, you know. So it'd be really, I mean, th 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 these lawyers are not great litigators. They are in these communities, living with these people, 
getting a climate established where you're going to make a demand as a citizen. And I just, I don't want that to get lost. I think the lawyers are very important, but not just as lawyers, as people. I mean, Marshall, during World War II, 40,000 miles a year in the field, in the field. You know, so I think that that's a piece that gets lost to the lawyers, or so and so and so and so Brown, or what was Warren thinking? Who cares? And, and Margaret's right. I mean, this, the South exploded in the wake of Brown, and they didn't even enforce it. They had Brown too, when you get around to it. And, and those lawyers thought about those children in Prince Edward County, and Spotswood Robinson said, what about them? Well, what about them? It wasn't going to be about them. These schools didn't desegregate until 1970. They saw, these lawyers saw generations being lost. These were human beings who had children, they had parents, they had families, they weren't just lawyers. And I think it's really important to understand that and to know who they are and not think, did they win, did they lose, or did, did someone tell them to do it now? It wasn't about the now, it was building, movement building. And you, Houston said that, this is not a store performance. This goes on without regard to personnel. You know, we, are, we have to show them we're building a movement from the ground up. And it all comes from that. And again, it's limited in its reach because of this country, but you can't discount what they were doing and what they knew they were doing, what they were risking, how they were using. That's a 25 years. What are you kidding? The long haul. But using their brilliance, these brilliant constitutional lawyers investing it back in the community and in, in, in this event. And we're, that's foreign to us nowadays, most of us. People do do it, but it's, um, you know, I mean, on the social frontier, these lawyers are going to make a commitment. So they're people, maybe <laughs> men and women, mostly men back then. But let, let me um, make an observation about when we're sitting there and saying what strategies people should have done this year or that year. Racism was so ingrained in the culture of America, not just the South, it was particularly. And, and you know, the first strategy of Charles Hamilton Houston, it's absolutely brilliant. He takes Plessy, which is the tool of oppression, and turns it as a sword against the white establishment. He says, fine, give me separate, you're gonna do have some, you're gonna give me equal. And they turn those cases uh, as, um, and, and they begin, and that's how they create these, many of these African American law schools, right Pat? I mean, they create them out of Gaines yeah. versus Canada, and uh, uh, that South Carolina School, Wrighton versus USC, uh, and, and they create the South Carolina State Law School, and they become, I mean, that's part of the Houston thing. But people would look back and say, I can't believe they were out there advocating Plessy. Well, they were dealing with the ground they were dealing on at that time. They didn't have somebody to say, oh, well, if you just argued the 13th Amendment, you'd have had a badge and everybody would have bought that. No, they were like, they were brilliant. And they were acting, you know, it's not just legal, it's not just the movement, it's not just political, it's all acting it's together. It's not just schools, it's that, criminal justice, it's, it's voting, it's, it's not just it's, it's, it's incredible, com and, and, and you know, uh, Randy, you were talking about the remarkable executive order of President Truman. Well, that was a product of black political activism. And it elected him in 1948, and he recognized the need for African American voters. That was voting, and the only place you could vote, which was, certainly wasn't in the South. But when the, after the successful desegregation of the Army, there was a secret study done by the Pentagon, by the Department of Defense, on the successful completion of that. And that report was asked for by the justices before Brown. They knew what they were doing. These things all overlap with each other. They, and they were doing what they could. And I know there's a great deal of criticism over the all deliberate speed, justified. Way he's wearing said, do it, do it now. And you know, there's clearly a conflict. It was unwise historically. But second guessing people who were basically doing something that 90% of white America was against. And doing it took an amazing amount of courage and they didn't get it all right but they made really important progress. And I just think second guessing them in it's hindsight second is- second guessing, but if you look at the thing, Marshall asked, just give me a deadline, you know? You so that, that's yeah. it, I mean, I, I, it's not second guessing, it's just- So, so I, I just wanted, so, you know, I, I'm all for civil rights hegeography, um, but I also um, do think that if we're gonna give them their due, uh, just like every other strategist, uh, we need to reflect on what they did and the choices they made. Mm -hmm. Um, that's uh, our duty, that's our obligation. 
um, as historians, as uh, students of history, um, and as participants in today's struggles. Um, so, you know, there's, for example, around gay marriage, there's a huge debate in the gay community about whether marriage was, you know, the, 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 the golden ring that folks should go for. And that's a more recent study, I mean, a more recent incident. Um, so, you know, half of the community or a large part of the community thinks that that's, you know, that's, that's actually putting, putting all your eggs in that basket is really not the way to win LGBT um, equality. Uh, and, and, and so, too, with respect to the choices that, that uh, um, Thurgood Marshall and uh, Charles Hammond Houston were making in the 1930s and 1940s, they created the world we're currently living in. It doesn't mean, though, that we can't look back and say, well, actually, maybe if they had not started at the college level, at the uh, yes, university level, maybe if they had started at the, um, uh, at the uh, elementary school level, maybe if they'd done A rather than B, they, we would have been in a different position today. They were enormously effective in what they did. They did set out the, um, the, uh, the arena uh, on which we, all of our civil rights are, uh, we understand all of our civil rights today. So we have to be, um, you know, reflective about the choice, reflective and respectful about the choices that they made. Can I jump in on, I want to second with an exclamation point that point, because I think it's true that people who feel grateful and feel, you know, prideful, uh, the friends of the civil rights revolution, it is easy to fall into hagiography. I revere Thurgood Marshall. Does that mean that every decision that Thurgood Marshall made over his long career is beyond question? The fact of the matter is, you know, he made decisions. Any person that's in the thick of a struggle is going to face dilemmas. And sometimes they're going to, you know, looking back, you might think that they made the right decision. Maybe you think that they made the wrong decision. We won't even confront that unless we're willing to ask the question. And so I think, I think you're absolutely right. And by the way, since we're talking about the 14th Amendment, you know, the 14th Amendment, like everything else we've talked about, was itself a product of compromise. The 14th Amendment, just two things. The 14th Amendment, for the first time in the constitutional history of the United States, draws the gender line. There had never prior to the 14th Amendment been any reference to gender. But in the 14th Amendment, one part of the 14th Amendment talks about voting. And in the part, the section two of the 14th Amendment says basically, if you disenfranchise men, you will be politically penalized. There had never been a reference to gender. And in fact, there were uh, women, the, 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 the feminists of the, of the period said, went to Frederick Douglass and said, Frederick Douglass, you've been on our side. Come out against the 14th Amendment because the 14th Amendment is putting women down. And it put Douglass in a tough position. And he made a decision. He said, I'm not going to go with you. This is the Negro's hour. There's a second thing. The 14th Amendment was criticized. Again, just to hear what I just said. You know, let's not forget, well, there had to be a 15th Amendment. Why did there have to be a 15th Amendment? There had to be a 15th Amendment because the 14th Amendment did not do for purposes of disfranchisement. The Congress was willing to say, we don't want the ex-Confederates to have more political power now than they had before the Civil War. But they also weren't in a position in 1868 to require around the country uh, that you know, black men be allowed to vote. So they reached a compromise. The 14th Amendment was itself the creature of compromise. We've been talking about segregation. In 1868, they talked about segregation. The way in which they talked about it had to do with the third rail of American racial politics for a long time, namely anti-miscegenation. They talked a lot about, well, if we pass this, 
What does that mean for laws that prohibit marriage across the race line? What do the Republicans, including radical Republicans, say? They said, listen, you can have the 14th Amendment, and it will not encroach upon state laws prohibiting marriage across the race line, because under, the, under equal protection, you're handling everybody the same way. Well, that was the theory of segregation. So, you know, the 14th Amendment was an advance, but it was limited. The 13th Amendment was an advance, it was limited. The 14th Amendment was an advance, it was limited. The 15th Amendment. In 1870, when they passed the 15th Amendment, there were people who said, hey, listen, if you just say that the states cannot, that the states are prohibited from excluding people on the basis of race, you know, people who want to exclude the, the black people will figure out another way of doing it. They'll go to literacy tests. They'll go to property tests. They'll do it in a lot of different ways. The people who passed the 15th Amendment said, okay, we understand that. We're going to pass this limited 15th Amendment anyway. You know, the Reconstruction Amendments were in advance, but they were limited. And, you know, all of the people that we've been lauding were limited just like we are. And we should, I think, a la Professor Burnham, remember to be critical at all times, including the people that we revere. But you know what? It's lunchtime. It's, it's, <laughs> it's time. I think we've had a wonderful panel. I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.